is not really. And here we go. It's the Benjamin Dixon Show. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is not really peace in our time, but peace in all time. I have no fear whatsoever of anybody or anything. Did you think no one was watching? In injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Your mission. To boldly go where no man has gone before. To reclaim the American dream. To be given the right of human being. To be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities. Bye -bye. Any mean it's the Benjamin Dixon Show. If you're hearing his voice, you're hearing the voice of reason. You suddenly come to the right place. Welcome. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Benjamin Dixon Show. I am your host, Benjamin Dixon, and there is a lot going on in the world today around us in the news. Uh, first up, it's Chapel Hill, North Carolina. If you haven't heard by now, there was a shooting uh, involving three students, um, actually three students that were killed um, by Craig Stephen Hicks. Um, we've also gotten the confirmed death of... Um, American hostage being held by ISIS, Kayla Mueller. It's been confirmed that she has been killed. Um, and in other news, New York prosecutors have indicted um, rookie cop in the killing of Akai Gurley. And three men in Mississippi have been sentenced for the killing of James Craig Anderson back in 2011. I don't know if you remember that story, but I remember that well. Uh, so there's a lot going on in the news. Um, and, and at the bottom of the totem pole, this isn't, you know, major news for a lot of people, but if you're a fan of political satire, you've heard by now that John Stewart is leaving the daily show. And, and, you know, maybe that's not headline news, but that is something significant for those of us who are uh, fans of political uh, satire and just politics in the news. Uh, it's going to be a, a pretty big deal going on in the future. So there's a lot going on. I want to jump in right away with the killings in um, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Very sad story. Um, let me just play you this, this clip. What's going on? Yeah, we really don't know much at all right now. Police are not saying much. You can see they are still out here right now. Here's what we do know. They say they have a person of interest that's in custody and that there is no ongoing threat to the public. Still, three people in this neighborhood are dead. It's a neighborhood full of Chapel Hill students. And tonight, neighbors and some family members really want to just, just want to know what's going on. So what's going on is it's it's actually breaking news in the sense of nobody reported on this yesterday uh this happened five o'clock yesterday uh in south carolina i'm sorry north carolina and nobody really said anything about it until this morning and so just this morning we're getting the name um names of the victims and we're getting the names of the uh of the uh suspect uh the name of the suspect is craig stephen hicks and um He's he's uh, alleged to, uh, to have killed three Muslim students. Now, um, on the surface, it immediately looks like it could have been a hate crime. We don't know. Some reports are saying that it's a um, it was over a dispute of over parking. And here, here's the problem I have with with that. OK, I understand road rage. I understand getting so furious about something minute, something that happens that just kind of takes you over the top. But the, that's three people. You know, you can't excuse any number of people being killed. You can't excuse murder at all. Right. But if this was like a spontaneous thing and he just lost control, you know, I can see you losing control on, over one person. But then to turn and kill and shoot another person female and then to kill a third person you know there is something going on more here than just the dispute over a parking space now we don't know there's it's still at the very beginning of the investigation and i'm sure we'll find out more as the today i'm sure we'll find out more today but what we do know about craig um stephen hicks if you go to his facebook page you will see that he is um a staunch atheist a proud atheist and he has spoken out against every religion, especially Islam. 
And so prosecutors, I'm sorry, not prosecutors, but the police are currently looking to see if this was um, if there was a hate crime, if it was hate motivated. And that puts an interesting spin on it, in my honest opinion. It puts an interesting spin on it because you don't really hear often of um, extreme atheists who are out killing people because of their beliefs. You know, usually when you hear that, you hear that the exact opposite. You hear of radical Islamists who are out killing people because uh, killing the infidels. Or you hear about extreme uh, extremist Christians or uh, Christian conservative extremists, uh, militia types, the Klan out doing uh, vicious things. So it puts an interesting spin on it because um, this guy was, you know, he wasn't what you would think. At first glance, which is why you really can't make assumptions um, over stories. You can't what you hear in the news. You have to dig a little deeper and you'll find that this this story is going to be very nuanced. This is not going to be uh, an open and shut case where you can just dismiss this guy as some uh, crazy conservative um, um, redneck from South North Carolina out to kill Muslims. Because that's not what he was. He was actually um, progressive in his politics from what we can gather off his Facebook page. He was actually um, he wasn't a Christian. He was he was an atheist. I mean, so it puts an interesting spin on it because a lot of times you don't hear about atheists doing these types of things. And, 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 And I'll talk about that more. One another thing that was interesting was uh, already. Uh, Richard Dawkins. I don't know if you know Richard Dawkins, but he's an outspoken um, in many respects uh, what people consider to be one of the leaders uh, in the atheist. And and, and I can't say this atheistic movement because it's not really a movement um, that I know of, Um, but he's very uh, he's outspoken. And a lot of times it's just people with the biggest mouth who becomes your spokesperson. And so uh, they've already gone to him and he's already condemned uh, these killings, which which, you know, that kind of blows me away. Why is it? Why is it that every time something bad happens, we go to the leaders of that quote unquote community and expect them to condemn as if they have some type of responsibility for the actions of a crazy person? Why is that? I I don't understand that. I always get, that always gets on my nerves. Every time somebody out of the, the black community does something crazy, they, they run and see what Al Sharpton has to say about it. And not that he's the leader of the black community. But like I said, those with the biggest mouth are sometimes automatically seen as your leader. Right. Um, let someone from the uh, Islamic community do something crazy. Then we're all of a sudden looking for an Islamic leader to condemn it. Why is it that we look for other people to um, try to hold them on the carpet for something somebody crazy did? I mean, this guy was obviously sick in his head. He something was wrong with him at a bare minimum. He had a, a, a deficit in humanity and love and common sense. I mean, it's just, you know, who who has it in them? I mean, if you're listening, how many of you actually have it in you to kill somebody over anything? So. It's it's we we look to people and we play politics with every single situation. And I think that's kind of the thing with Richard Dawkins having to apologize. You know, I'm, I'm no I'm no Richard Dawkins fan. You may not even know who he is, but I know who he is and I'm not a fan. He actually gets on my nerves quite often. But to have him have to apologize for something a, a psycho did is just as ridiculous. I get just as frustrated about that as if somebody looked to um, Al Sharpton to apologize for something a black guy did. You know, that's ridiculous. That's that's silly. That's that's foolishness. But but it speaks to a larger issue in our in our uh, political landscape. It speaks to a larger issue in our society where we 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 are looking for somebody. We're looking for an opportunity to flip a situation, no matter how tragic it is. We want to flip it politically and we want to extract political concessions because of some psycho. But the, the truth of the matter is people. There are crazy people out there. And this Craig Stephen, uh, I can't even get his name right. Uh, Stephen Hicks, Craig Stephen Hicks. He he's obviously if this pans out to be what we think it is, he's obviously just lost his mind. And in the in the course of him losing his mind, you know, three people have lost their lives. Three people, a young man, his wife, they just got married in December and, and his sister and the I'm sorry, his wife's sister, all of them under the age of 23, 
23, 21, and 19 have lost their lives because of the actions of a crazy man. And the other interesting thing about this is that, uh, like I mentioned before, you don't normally see this. And a lot of times people look, um, you don't normally see this coming from, uh, quote unquote, atheists. You see this coming from, you know, religious extremists. We think of extremism and we try to make it a religious thing. But in reality, you know, crazy comes in every type of form. Crazy, crazy comes from everywhere. Crazy comes from every ideology, every philosophy, every, every political persuasion. People can be crazy. Humans can be not even human, subhuman, animals, barbaric. And, and so we have to stop looking, in my opinion, and this is just, this is my bully pulpit. You tuned into my bully pulpit. We have to stop looking for um, categorical condemnation. We have to stop trying to blame um, an entire group of people for the problems that we see, especially when they're based on the actions of individuals. Yeah, there are, quote unquote, a lot of extremists, but they're extremists in every single camp, which is why it, which is why it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me that we don't ostracize or we don't isolate a group and try to make them all look like they are the only bad people in the world. Because if we don't look inside of our own group, we'll realize that we have some crazies too. You know, if you know me for any time, you know my background. I am a Christian. That, that's me. I, I grew up. When, I believe it. I, that's me. I live it. You know, the best I can. <laughs> I have some, you know, have some proclivities. You know, I might, if you listen any amount of time, you know, I might slip up and say something. I have my problems. But that's besides the point. The point is this. The point is this. I cannot look at another group and say that group is the problem. I have to look at the individual who did it and say that is the problem. The individual is that is the problem. But the overall diagnosis, the symptoms, it, it's not the religion. You know, it's not the philosophy. It's not the political persuasion. That's the problem. The problem is the deficit in love and in humanity and the basic humanity, because how else can you explain some of the things that are happening? I mean, people literally and later on, I'm going to discuss uh, the issue in Mississippi. Um, the, the, the three guys, three guys, two girls from Mississippi left the party and said, let's go find a nigga to kill. Now, your gut reflex would be, oh, that's Mississippi. But no, that's not Mississippi. Your gut reflex would be, oh, that's Southerners. No. That's not Southerners. I grew up in Mississippi. I know plenty of good Southerners. You know, the problem, you can't put a category on the problem except for this. The problem is a deficit in humanity and basic concern and empathy. The people who do these types of things, they're less than human. The people who, who, who hurt others and find pleasure, the sadistic mentality, that's that's not, you can't pin that on a religion. And there's so many places I want to go with this. There's a whole lot that we, we just getting started. I, there's a lot that I have to say about this because it crosses every ideology. There's a lot I have to say about this because it goes straight into our political spec, uh, uh, um, issues of today. There's a reason why, listen, there is a reason why President Obama will not call them radical Islamist. And you may not agree with that reason. But there's a legitimate reason because should I go into this right now? Okay, I'm going to go into this right now. <laughs> the funniest thing is when you see the intersection. The intersection of ideologies. What do you mean by that? Good question. I'm glad you asked. What I mean by that is when you see people who normally are at odds with each other, completely against each other. And you see them crossing ideologies at a point where they agree on something. That's the funniest thing to watch. For instance, um, for instance, you have far right evangelical Christians who view Islam as a threat. They view Islam as, um, for lack of a better word, they view them as an enemy. 
and they are angry because President Obama will not label it radical Islam. On the flip side, you have um, far left liberals who often are atheists who also see Islam as a threat. And they are also upset with the fact that President Obama won't call it radical Islam. You know, so you have these two extreme polar opposites that normally disagree on every single thing. And the funniest thing is watching their heads explode when Mike Huckabee realizes he agrees with Bill Maher on something. You know, that's the funniest thing in the world uh, because there's there's a saying there's a, actually not a saying there's a political um, um, uh, there's a political theory um, called the horseshoe theory, meaning um, the, the, the background of it is that people on the opposite end, the far left and the far right, we think of them as being complete opposites. But on certain issues, we find out the people on the far left and on the far right have more in common than the rest of us in the middle. Thus, the horseshoe, you take a, a line, you know, I don't know if you can see it. you take a line and you bend that line and you get a horseshoe. So you have people on two extremes who are now in agreement with something. And now all of them are looking at President Obama. I'm going to bring this back. Just stay with me. Uh, the, all of them are upset with President Obama because he won't call it extreme. I'm sorry, radical Islam. But why should he call it radical Islam when it's going to take effect? It's go the people in the Middle East. People in the Middle East, Middle Eastern leaders have asked the United States, they have asked us to not call it radical Islam. Why? Because they realize this in order for them to defeat ISIS, they need Muslim nations. They need the, to win the hearts and keep the hearts and the minds of the Muslim people. And so if you call it radical Islam, all of a sudden you have isolated and you have you have targeted an entire faith. And I know there's those who are, who are saying, yes, it's the entire faith. Muslim Islam is the problem. Yeah. But look at this today. In Chapel Hill, it wasn't a religion that killed these three Muslims. It was an idea. It wasn't a, a particular ideology that killed these three Muslim students. It was a guy who had no humanity in him. And so we can't isolate an entire group and say that group is the problem because we need them. Maybe I stretched you out too, too far. Maybe you can't follow that logic, but for me, it makes perfect sense. Why would we do something to offend the very people that we need to be fighting alongside us? And while you are, you know, while people are out here losing their minds, oh, he's not calling it radical Islam for good reason, because we cannot isolate the people that we need to fight the fights that we need to fight. But because because of your proclivities and your hatred for Islam, whether you are a radical Christian or whether you are uh, extreme liberal and you want you want to call it like it is. It's radical Islam because we're not giving you your fix and catering to to your proclivities. Now, now you know, the president isn't doing his job. Come on. No, he's doing his job by maintaining a coalition and realizing this simple fact. Come full circle and I'm going to leave you alone. This simple fact is that we cannot look at an entire group of people and say they are the problem. The Islamic faith is not responsible for ISIS. ISIS is responsible for ISIS. Atheists are not responsible for Craig Hicks. He, Hicks is responsible for Hicks. And that's the whole point. The whole point is we have to stop looking at these categorical things, trying to make it seem like, trying to make it seem like everybody has to answer for this. Listen, we're going to take a break and we'll be right back after this. Hey, if you're like me, you're probably hearing the news that the economy is getting better, right? But there's one problem. You still don't have a job. Get back into the game with Chance.com, the state-of-the-art online employment connection for the new generation. Get access to millions of jobs on Chance that are actually hiring now. 
Stop searching for outdated job postings. Log on to Chance.com, create a profile, and then be found. Make the connection you need to get hired today. If you're serious about your career, you've got to check this out. Chance.com. Get that job. Make that chance with Chance.com. J-A-N-Z-Z dot com. The traditional light bulb, a groundbreaking invention in 1879. It's time we switch to longer-lasting Energy Star light bulbs. They're more efficient than the old bulbs, like a text message is more efficient than a carrier pigeon. And they cut down on our energy costs. Because in our own groundbreaking age, we deserve a light bulb that saves us some cash. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy and the Ad Council. You feel petrified. You're struggling with your mortgage payments. Not knowing what to do. You do nothing. But if you do something you're far more likely to get the most positive outcome. Making Home Affordable is a free government program. Call 888-995-HOPE to talk one-on-one with a housing expert about your options. Call 888-995-HOPE or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. It's 6.42 p.m. Time for Steve Plato and his son Dylan to do the dishes. They talk about everything from the yuckiness of girls to the awesomeness of his soccer team. Sometimes they don't talk at all. Then, hey! the dreaded <laughs> splash fight. It's dad o'clock, and it's the best time of the day. Because the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Welcome back to the Benjamin Dixon Show. Buckle up for the ride. Give us a call, 857-600-0518. Welcome back from the break. I remember, uh, clear as day, I think it was, I was down in Florida and I was reading the story, and I mentioned it earlier, about um, about the three guys, two girls, who in Mississippi after they left the party, they were drunk and they decided to um, go and, and they use these exact words. If I, if I remember the quote, right, let's go find a nigga and kill him. Something to that effect. And one of the things that bothered me the most about this was, you know, they, they arrested, they did arrest the, um, the young men, but they did not arrest the young women. And so last night it came out that the three young men who were involved in that killing they got sentenced. One got sentenced to 50 years. One, I believe, to something around 13 years and one to seven years. Um, uh, and I guess it was based on who was leading and who, I mean, because this was a hate crime, this was tried as a, as a hate crime. So it wasn't just simple, simply whether or not they killed the person, but it was the, the motivation behind it. And in this case, uh, the guy who actually said those words, I believe he was the one who got the most time, 50 years. You know, I, <laughs> Personally, and and I did a little bit of digging, digging, and the girls who were involved, who were in the truck, also, um, the girls who were in the truck, they also got, um, they pled guilty, and they got sentenced to, I think, something ridiculously low, like three to five years maximum each. <laughs> three to five years. Now, granted. First of all, I'm glad they went back and arrested the girls or the girls, you know, surrendered or however that played out. I'm glad that that little bit amount of justice uh, took place because at first the girls were not under arrest. It was just the guys, Um, but they got them and they pled guilty. And I'm assuming I'm just going to assume that maybe the girls testified against the guys. Because how else can you explain being present in a murder? Let me describe it to you. They ran over him in a truck. You can see it on a video. You can't see it clear, but you can see it. There's footage, uh, security camera footage. And how else can you explain getting three to five years being an accessory to murder? They must they had to have turned state. They had to have testified against the, the guy. So I'm going to assume that 
Um, I haven't found any articles to that effect. If you know something about it, uh, send it to me at the BBD show um, at the Benjamin Dixon show dot com. Tell me about it so I can post it and read it. You know, how do they get three to five years? And then the guy who was the, one of the guys that got seven years. I mean, what is that? How often do you see? How often do you see people involved in a murder? Cold blooded hate crime murder get less than life in prison. I mean, this is Mississippi. Now, granted, it was tried underneath federal uh, hate crime laws, you know, and I don't know what's the maximum um, penalty. I don't know if the death sentence is maximum, but this is Mississippi. I'm I'm just going to conclude because of the redness, uh, the the conservative nature of that state that they have uh, the death penalty. So I just can't imagine um, that something like this, if it had been tried on the state level, would not warrant the death penalty. But they got three to five years. Um, and I remember the story clear as day because instantly people started with their gut reaction, uh, convicting the South and convicting Mississippi in particular and convicting Southerners. And, and I found myself in a very difficult position because I, you know, that doesn't fly with me. You know, I know plenty of people from Mississippi. I know plenty of people from Louisiana and Alabama. I know some really, I know some of the best people in the world are from the South. You know, I live in Massachusetts now. We broadcast Massachusetts, uh, the Boston area. And, and, you know, I know a lot of nice people up here, but I know a lot of just hateful, bitter, spiteful. We call them mass as in Massachusetts. We call them mass holes, you know, so you can find you can find just evil people no matter where you go. So this wasn't indicative of the South and anybody who grew up in the South, you know what I'm talking about. Um, now, <laughs> granted, this might have been indicative of the South, let's say just uh, 40 or 50 years ago. <laughs> you know, that was a different time. But you know, I grew up in the 80s where it was OK to have white friends and where it was OK to have interracial dating. You know, it was when I say OK, it was better. It, it wasn't um, it, it wasn't what it was back in the 60s when they would straight lynch you over some things like that. So, yes, they have a past. But. What I say, I found myself in a difficult spot because here I am defending Mississippi against people, um, against people who uh, who speak ill of the South because of the, the, the history of the South. And don't get me wrong, if, if anybody understands and, and empathizes and identifies with the struggle, um, the, the civil rights struggle of, of the past, the civil rights struggle of today, it's me. Right. Um, I, I, I'm right alongside with all of you with the things and the issues that we have to fight. But you have to realize, just like with the opening segment, we cannot categorically condemn an entire region over the actions over a, of, of a bunch of kids. And I don't know. I think I forgot how old they are now. They were kids when this happened. They were leaving. They were teenagers leaving. Yeah, you know, I'm going to take that off the table. They weren't kids it's because, you know, truth be told, had they been a different skin persuasion, they would be seen as grown men. So I'm going to take that off the table. They weren't kids. But regardless, we cannot condemn an entire region. And, and so I often find myself in this um, in this crucible, if you would, between uh, uh, two ideologies, because I find myself I, uh, uh, defending defending people who others just really would never defend. You know, people want to condemn Southerners. Well, I, you know, you can't do that on my show. You can call in, you could try it. It would be fun. <laughs> you know, we'd have a good time, but you know, you're going to have to speak specifically to the problem, not to, and not, not categorically and try to just condemn everybody because I can do that to you. You know, it could be done to me. I uh, look at the guy in New York, uh, the New York guy who killed the two police officers. You know, they tried desperately to pin that on the entire black lives movement. That's what they wanted more than anything else. Thankfully, we, you know, we're, we're hip to that game. We know that political maneuver. But my thing is this. If we know the actions of how other people fight, right, we know the illogical statements and the, the illogical conclusions, right? Why would we engage in the same exact thing? For instance, if we know, and we always talk about Fox News, if we know Fox News is just a, a straight propaganda machine, why would we allow ourselves to become a propaganda machine just because they are? So we can't engage in the same type of tactics that other people do simply because they're doing it. We have to have a better stand. We have to be better than that. And so when I look at this case, you know, I'm glad that there was some type of semblance of justice, some type, 
you know, it's disappointing that these kids, these guys, these these grown people, um, these hate filled monsters, um, if you want to call them little anything, call them little devils, you know, who went out intentionally to kill a black man. I'm glad we got a semblance of justice because they will go to jail. But I'm highly disappointed in the fact that half of them, you know, more than half of them, three of the five are going to spend less time in jail than some of you listening are going to spend in college. <laughs> so anyway, somebody, you know, somebody help me out with that. Find me some information as far as why the girls weren't charged uh, or didn't get more time. You can post it on the Facebook page. I don't have all the information, but like I said, we got a little bit of just in other news In other news. Uh, good old speaker Boehner, speaker Boehner. You know what? Let me not let me not uh, <laughs> tell you what he said. I want you to just listen to what he said. The House did its job. We won the fight to fund the Department of Homeland Security and to stop the president's unconstitutional actions. Now it's time for the Senate to do their work. You know, in the, in the gift shop out here, they've got these little booklets on how a bill becomes a law. Right? The House has done its job. Uh, why don't you go ask the Senate Democrats when they're going to get off their ass and do something? <laughs> when? This is Speaker Boehner. Speaker Boehner is saying, John Boehner is saying, when will the Senate Democrats get off their ass and do something? Now, if you're, if you're not up to date, let me give you the 30-second uh, version of what's going on. We're trying to get funding for the Department of Homeland Security, right? Funding is getting ready to run out, all right? A political move by the Republican Democrat, uh, the uh, Republican Democrats, by the Republican Senate and congressmen. Um, they are trying to stuff inside of this funding bill for the Homeland Security. They're trying to stuff in it provisions to gut President Obama's actions on immigration. So they're trying to use the for something that we have to have, which is funding for the Department of Homeland Security. Right. The people who are charged with protecting the homeland, the, the, their, their job is in their name, an important organization, important bureaucracy, you know, ostensibly important. Yes, they're important. OK, they're trying to stuff in this funding, something that we have to have. They're trying to get and gut President Obama's executive actions on immigration because now, mind you, when they had an opportunity to actually do something on immigration, Congress didn't act. They didn't want to do anything. Any action that was meaningful from the Senate was blocked and filibustered by the Republicans when the Democrats were in power. And now that the Democrats are not in power, <laughs> they're using the filibuster to hold up or they're threatening the filibuster to hold this up. Right. The irony, the, the just the blatant irony and it's, of Speaker Boehner complaining about Democrats not doing anything is hilarious <laughs> because for between 2009 and 2015, just now, Senate Republicans filibustered and blocked every meaningful piece of legislation that we tried to get out of Congress. Not, um, listen, not once, not, we're not talking about a few times. We're talking about hundreds of times every single year. They blocked meaningful legislation, things that mattered. And now, you know, Boehner gets in his press conference a few minutes ago and, you know, with his little glib, um, pious look on his face, like he actually did something, wants to complain about the fact that Democrats aren't doing anything. <laughs> Three, uh, wait, two months in, two months in, and he's complaining. What about uh, Speaker Boehner? What about the other years? You're complaining about two months. What about the last six years? What about that? What about the fact that you guys have done nothing and had this big ceremony yesterday over a piece of legislation that was meaningful uh, for uh, uh, um, for for psychological help for um, wounded veterans, veterans, veterans with um uh, who are facing challenges to prevent suicide amongst veteran, veterans, a great, great piece of legislation. We're glad it was passed. President Obama's getting ready to sign it. We're excited about it. Great. But they had this big signing ceremony yesterday. 
And I guess it makes sense because they hadn't signed anything in almost six years. But now they want to complain about that. The, the irony of it. So it, it, it tells me, and in the background, <laughs> let me stop there. In the background was Congressman uh, Scalise. And, and if you don't know who Congressman uh, Scalise is, um, he is the congressional majority whip for the Republican Party. And he um, caused quite a bit of a controversy because he spoke before um, a, an organization that was directly connected with the Ku Klux Klan. That Ku Klux Klan. The extreme conservative uh, ex uh, Christian extremist group, the Ku Klux Klan. And here he is, the majority whip. Uh, sitting in the background, just grinning ear to ear because I guess they felt like they had some political posturing over the Democrats. Fine, whatever the case may be. But but he here's my thing. I, I if you're listening to me you, you, and you didn't know, you should know. You know, I'm a I'm a proud Democrat. I'm a proud. Uh, well, let me take that. I'm a Democrat as long as they are going to do what needs to be done. I'm a proud progressive. And whatever, that's what I am. Wherever the progressive movement is, that's where I'm going to be. And if there ever comes a time where the Democrats no longer no longer represents uh, progressive ideas, then I'll drop the D just as quickly um, as some Republicans drop the D back at a time. Well, I'm going to leave that alone. So I'm a proud progressive. And what drives me crazy is how blatantly conservatives can tell you what they represent and what they stand for. And you either act surprised or you don't care. For instance, Jeb Bush just hired and subsequently fired a guy who openly on Twitter, because Twitter is public, openly called women whores and Talked about Halloween giving um, ugly whores the opportunity to dress up or some some type of just deeply offensive, ridiculously hateful towards women rhetoric that he posted on his page in his Twitter feed. Jeb Bush thought apparently this guy was qualified to be to head up his social media operations for this 2016 campaign. Like where. And, and, and it's not that George uh, Jeb Bush didn't know about these things because he asked the young man. I can't pronounce his last name. He asked him to go back and delete those old tweets. So he was fully aware of what was going on. He was fully aware of what this guy said, but he thought it was OK to hire him anyway. What does that say to you? What does that say to you in terms of their priorities, in terms of what they view? And what does it say to you that the congressional uh, uh, Republicans are more interested in fighting or their fear of immigrants? They're, they're, they're more interested in opposing President Obama's actions on immigration than they are protecting the country and funding the homeland security. What does that tell you about their priorities? It tells me that their priorities are very singular. They, they have a very narrow focus of how they view the world and what's important to them. And people who don't believe what they believe, people who don't have the same sexual organs as they have, people who don't have the same skin tone as them are not as important to them. Because if we were, then there's no way in the world Jeb Bush would hire a guy who's going to refer to women as whores knowingly now he can make a mistake and do it yeah that's reasonable but he knew about it and hired him anyway and the only reason he fired him is because twitter went up in an uproar knowingly put a guy like scalise as the majority whip when he's for all intents and purposes the motivational speaker for the clan <laughs> you know knowingly putting the nation at risk putting the Department of Homeland Security at risk of losing funding for sake of opposing Obama's immigration policies or executive uh, orders. So that tells you that maybe, you know, maybe it's harsh. Maybe we shouldn't call them sexist, xenophobes, you know, racist. Maybe that's not what they are. But at a minimum, 
we are not their priority. Because if we were priority to them, they would never, they would never put certain people in positions of authority to represent their party. I don't know. That's just, that's just my soapbox. So it just blows me away. It, it blows me away that, that we allow, we allow this party to pretend, to, to pretend to care about anybody other than their very elite group. When the reality is they show us every single day exactly who they are. You're tuned in to The Benjamin Dixon Show. Join the conversation, 857-600-0518. Looking for the right business opportunity? Need the right product, the right marketing plan, and the absolute best training in the world? Well, look no further. The elite team, every leader in time, excels. They believe the key ingredients in becoming successful in life and in business are just a keystroke away. Go to www.eliteteamsite.com. That's www.eliteteamsite.com. The Elite Team has a system in place that will move you closer to achieving your goals and dreams. Visit www.eliteteamsite.com or TonyFlemingEnterprises.com today. College is important, but it can also be expensive. College Planning Services is a group of educators, administrators, counselors, and other licensed professionals that work together to provide the necessary services, networks, and information to reach students that are serious about getting a college education. College Planning Services partners with financial institutions, corporate sponsors, and other major players in the global market to strategize in building a pool of information regarding financial aid, scholarships, and funding information to assist students in preparing to access the essential resources to build upon their path to an education educational future. Learn more at collegeplanningtoday.com and let us help you start your college career. Do you want to take your business to the next level? Ultimate Business Solutions provides the support you need to increase your customer base and sell more products and services online. Specializing in graphic arts, web development, and internet marketing, Ultimate Business Solutions creates the face of your business. If you're looking for a custom logo, dynamic website, or popping marketing material, call Ultimate Business Solutions today at 404-704-2197 or visit www.ultimatebizsolutions.com. Ultimate Business Solutions. Let us create your future. Do you have tax issues? Oh, back taxes or need tax relief? Contact L and B Tax Service today. L and B offers you over 15 years of expertise and first-class tax service for individuals, professionals, and business owners with nationwide service. You can easily find a location near you. Contact one of our tax professionals through our website, lbtaxservice.com. That's www.lbtaxservice.com. L and B Tax Service Incorporated. Tax professionals that you can trust. You've tuned in to the Benjamin Dixon Show. Hey, no, 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 Welcome back. Welcome back to the Benjamin Dixon Show. I'm your host, Benjamin Dixon. Uh, one of uh, my producer came in during the break, and you might have heard it. I don't know. We're still figuring this thing out here. Um, and he brought to my attention that the CTO, uh, Jeb Bush's CTO, actually was not fired. Uh, he resigned from that position, and I think they have moved him into a different position. Um, and so that's that's interesting to know. So it's not and, – and Jeb Bush, of course, made him apologize. And then somebody else commented on Facebook and said that, you know, this happened six years ago. This happened six years ago, so he was just a kid when he said these things. Yeah, he was. I, you know what? Part of me wants to have empathy for that, you know, because, you know, maybe if Twitter was around when I was his age, I would have done something stupid like that. Um, but then again, it just speaks to the character of the person. You know, it, it speaks to their starting point. You know, maybe he's evolved. Maybe he has. But. You know, if your role, if your role is going to be um, to head up the 
the technology wing of an entire presidential election. Um, so, you know, you have to have had some common sense. You have to had you must have known even six years ago uh, that your words are going to forever be in cyberspace. You know, that's why I feel I feel bad for some of these kids out here because, you know, I think they realize that, but they don't realize the implication and, and how far that's going to reach. So I maybe I have a little bit of empathy regards to how young he was when he said what he said. But honestly, no, I don't care. I don't care. You know, you're going to be he was in college. He wasn't a teenager. You know, he was grown enough to understand the ramifications of your words in on the cyber on the Internet. I almost said cybernet. Goodness, it's been a long day. Another correction from uh, my producer saying that um, the young guy, uh, Butler, who got seven years, he got seven years because of his cooperation. Actually, that's from Facebook. Seven, seven years because of his cooperation. OK, you know what? I mean, because truth be told, somebody if I'm with somebody and they do something stupid like that, you know, I'm going to try to stop them. First of all, I am going to try to stop them. But if I can't, you better believe you better believe I'm going to be the first one. Yes. You can quote me on this. I'm going to be the first one to turn state and like, yep, he did it. There's no prisoner's dilemma for me. No, no. I, I'm going, if you do something stupid around me, you know, I got a family to raise. I got, I got kids to put through college. I'm not, I'm not going down for you. That whole no snitch policy, forget it. So he got seven years because he snitched. All right. I, you know, I can, I can deal with that because that helped us get everyone else. This is dealing with the case in Mississippi where the five of them were in a truck and they ran over, um, they ran over the black man, the, he was a father, a brother, you know. So in other news, so many things going on. John Stewart, John Stewart is leaving the Daily Show. And, and I don't know about you, but I mean, I can't say I grew up with John Stewart, but, you know, a lot of my formative years were with John Stewart. And what I appreciate about John Stewart is that uh, regardless of your political ideology, if you did something <laughs> that was critique worthy. You got critiqued from the left, from the right. It didn't matter. And in terms of just society, the broader society, it reminds me of um, this, this idea in literature and probably very true in history that it was the court jester who always had the ability to tell the king the truth because he told it through a joke uh, and through laughter and that's what um, that's what John Stewart represents. He represents uh, truth to power, but not in the way, you know, not in the preachy way, not in the protester way, not in any other way. He was he did it through laughter and he was able to shine, um, you know, light on a lot of situations through jokes. You know, and I was going to play some clips from him. But, you know, if you're listening to me, you've already had, you know, you're probably very familiar with. Uh, John Stewart. So it's going to be a, a, a gaping hole in um, political satire. Um, and and, I, and I, I keep saying political satire, but the truth of the matter is, you know, he gave us the truth and he gave us the news. It, we just happened to laugh about it. So you can't um, diminish the impact that he had to society, um, to society, to uh, political society. I would say that much. You can't uh, belittle it or diminish it because he did it through comedy. So, you know, it's he's not gone yet, but that's a major thing that's happening. Uh, the other thing that's happening, Brian Williams, Brian Williams suspended for six months without pay. Because he told the story of his experience in Baghdad and, and the Iraqi war, he told it wrong. Intentionally, he lied. Right. Whatever. He lied. He lied. Whether he remembered, misremembered, whatever he described it as, he lied. And, you know, it's it's you. life is so much stranger than fiction. If someone were to tell you that we would end up in a decades long war. Over. Lies that came from our leaders. And that was that were echoed through our media and that war would lead to the deaths of thousands of Americans and hundreds of thousands of uh, Iraqis. And that war would uh, destabilize the entire region leading to Al Qaeda coming into Iraq, which they were not there before leading ultimately to ISIS being able to take over portions of Iraq that a lot of soldiers died for. 
If someone told you years ago that those lies would lead to where we are right now, but the only person who would be penalized for it was a guy who lied about his trip in a helicopter. <laughs> you, you, you can't make this up. You can't make this up. And so while everyone is looking at Brian Williams saying, oh, he's, you know, we can't trust him. Hell, we can't trust the media at all because you sold us. Yes, you, the media, sold us the Iraqi war. And then we're like, Meh, no big deal. They're not a, there's nothing. You know, they, they were like, you know, George Bush talking about the weapons of mass destruction. Later on, he said, I'm, I'm still trying to find those weapons in a joke. All glib and and callously like it was funny that his lies, the lies of the administration killed thousands of people. But the only person being penalized, punished for their lies is the guy. What does that tell you? That tells you you can lie to the American people and take us to war. Just don't lie about being heroic in that war. That's what it tells me. And also tells me that some people just want to be lied to. Some people just want the media to confirm what they believe. They just want the media to tell them what they want to hear. It goes beyond this idea of confirmation bias. You know, the idea that you seek out people to confirm your biases, but it goes further. And to me, it's the need, the inability to hear the truth, because if you hear the truth, you will feel like I'm melting. I'm melting. Like it's painful to you. Like, like it's, 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 it's physically painful for you to hear the truth when that truth goes counter to your biases. So some people just want to be lied to. And what it tells me the most is that, you know, we're in trouble here in America. If the media can get away with piss poor reporting and the only person that's going to pay any penalty for the Iraq war is the guy who misremembered, remembered incorrectly or lied. I don't care what he did over the fact that he was in a helicopter and he thought that it got hit when another one got hit. That tells me that we're in trouble in America because we are not concerned with what matters the most. We're concerned with what's going to stroke our philosophical and ideological ego. That's what we want. And that's problematic. And that's problematic on both sides. Not, yeah. And then in the news also, the, the, we have confirmation of the death of Kayla Mueller. And, um, you know, the parents held out and hoped that, uh, that it wasn't true. You know, and they got confirmation of death, proof of death from ISIS over the weekend. And, um, you know, we heard about it yesterday. And I don't know, for some reason, that thing bothered me like that, that really, I had to take a moment and pause because when you think about what that young woman was doing at the age of 26, she was, she did more by the age of 26 than most of us are going to do in our entire lives. She had helped more people in places where most of us are afraid to go. We'll never go. She did that by the age of 26. While most of us at 26 were still out partying. We had a little bit of money because we had our first real job and we were out partying. She was in Syria helping the refugees. And ultimately, that's how she got captured. And ultimately, that's how she died. So that thing that, that really that really put some things in perspective for me, like, you know, all this, all this out here that we're doing. You know, it, it really doesn't mean anything. We're all hustling, trying to get promotions. We're all hustling, trying to get a popularity or fame, We're trying to get money. You know, everybody's self-promoting, you know. And I'm guilty. I do it too. You know, and you see somebody with 
um, the most honest of intentions. Because I, there's there's no other way to categorize it. Who who is going to put their lives on the line and go to a region of the world engaged in a civil war because her heart was broken for them? And yeah, so that that thing that thing really really hit me kind of hard. And I want to read some of her words from her her last letter to her parents and to her family. She said, "I remember Mom always telling me that." All in all, in the end, the only one you really have is God. I have come to a place and experience where, in every sense of the word, I have surrendered myself to our creator because literally there was no one else. By God, by your prayers, I have felt tenderly cradled in free fall. I have been shown in darkness light. And have learned that ever, even in prison, one can be free. And I am grateful. I have come to see that there is good in every situation. Sometimes we just have to look for it. I pray each day that if nothing else, you have felt a certain closeness and surrender to God as well. And have formed a bond of love and support amongst one another. Kayla Mueller at 26. You know, I, I remember circling back. It's not, it's, it's not an ideology, a philosophy. It's not a political party. It's not a religion or it's not the lack of religion that can ever be categorically condemned as the problem because here, this beautiful young girl, woman, 26, you know, in the heat of being captured and held prisoner by one of the worst terrorist organizations we've ever seen. She still held on to her faith and she still managed to encourage others. And so we cannot look at another group and say that group is the problem. And by group, I mean a religion by group. I mean, particular ideologies. We look, we have to look at those who abuse the faith, that religion, that ideology, that political party identification, and we have to stop wasting time trying to point fingers at other people and say, you, 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 you are the problem. No, because if we look inside of ourselves and look inside of those who we agree with, with whom we agree, we'll realize that some of the problem lies on our backs. Some of the problem lies inside of our affiliations. Some of the problems there, there, there are people who are Christian. There are people who who go to churches that are like just like me, who are evil. There are people who go to mosque that are evil. There are people who go to synagogues that are evil. And there are people who sit at home and go nowhere who are evil. But like Kayla showed us, there are those in every ideology who represent the best of humanity. There are those who show us the best that humanity has to offer from every religion from every ideology, from every political persuasion. I don't care what you believe. Who are you inside? I, I don't care that you don't believe. Do you have a lack of humanity or do you have an abundance? And I don't compare, I can't, I don't try to pretend like I'm, you know, of the moral persuasion in the moral category of Kayla, because I don't think many people live that can be in that same league. You know, I'm out here hustling and grinding just like everybody else. I'm out here trying to make it just like everybody else. My focus is on taking care of my family. My focus is on getting ahead. You know, I don't have the moral character that she had to sacrifice everything to go on the opposite side of the world to take care of people that she never even knew. You know, I don't pretend to be in the same moral league, but but what I do know is that I don't care 
if you're Muslim, I don't care if you're Christian, I don't care if you're Jewish, agnostic, atheist, conservative, liberal. I don't care who you are. It's what you are inside that matters the most. And Kayla showed us. Kayla showed us that faith is not the worst thing in the world. Faith is not the enemy. The enemy, the enemies are people who do not have that humanity, who do not have that basic concern and love and empathy for their neighbor, for their brother, for their sister, for a stranger. That's the problem. People who can abuse their beliefs, people who can abuse religion, people can be, even atheism has now been abused in a sense. I mean, no, I know historically, but now we have an example. Unfortunately, we have an example of where even even those who don't believe in religion can act in ways that are less than human, barbaric, savage. So what's the point? Let me get off my soapbox. The point is this. We're all guilty. Every ideology, every belief system has been guilty and continued can be guilty. But you as an individual, who are you? What do you stand for? Do you have humanity? Do you have an abundance of humanity? And will you represent that humanity in the best way like Kayla Mueller did? Listen, thank you for joining us. Come back again. We'll let you know when we'll be back on the air, probably Friday. I don't know. We're just doing this thing. This has been the Benjamin Dixon Show. Thanks for being here, and we'll catch you next time.